All right, good evening, everyone. This is the curriculum workshop of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, November 21st, 2022, at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Weiner is absent, and Member Hughes. Here. There will be an extended public comment following the workshop presentation. We ask anyone interested in making a comment during this time to please fill out a card and turn it in um, at this time so that we may adhere to our 30 minute time frame and give everyone a fair opportunity to speak. All right, we're just gonna go right into the curriculum workshop. So welcome, Justin. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have two topics on the agenda. The first topic is equity in District 58. We're going to talk through the why we have this conversation, the state and local data, and some potential next steps based on all of that. And then after that, Kevin will come up and talk about safety in District 58 and the proactive measures that we take along those bullets that are there. So this is kind of where we're headed this evening. So why do we enter into the equity conversation at all? There are several forces that drive this conversation. First, the ISBE strategic plan requires it. These are all screenshots from portions of their 23-page strategic plan that really start to define some of the, the, the ISBE views around equity, the why, the equity statement they've presented, and really the tangible goals in the center that they've set around that equity journey continuum, which we've talked a little bit about, that really they did meet that goal this year, and it is published across the, the state, each district's place on that equity journey continuum. So ISBE, in their strategic plan, planning efforts really drives the beginning of this conversation for all school districts. We have board policy that references particularly, I've highlighted number eight in policy 610, that we are required to provide a climate and culture free of any bias concerning those protective classifications in policy 710. And then just to have it here as a reference point, this is policy 710. We won't read through all of these, but again, this really talks about the equal opportunities that need to be made available and making sure that there is no discriminatory practice on the basis of any protected status in District 58. Our strategic plan, which was again adopted back in 2018, specifically called out equitable access and equitable experiences for students in two of the goals that were part of that plan. And so obviously this is one of those places we can point to and say we've been engaged in this work for many, many years. Whether or not we, we brought it to the forefront at this level, we certainly had a number of groups that focused on equitable access and equitable experiences. And the other reality is that our local information, what we know about living and working in District 58, we've taken a, a strong stance as a community and, and, and the board as well of learners around making sure that we are identifying subgroup performance data as we go through. And you'll see some subgroup discipline data comes up a little bit later. And so we want to make sure that you know we are honoring that commitment to look at that information, not just from a high level, but across the board. And we also, we do have to acknowledge that we have heard from District 58 families, from some current students and from some former students about experiences in which they felt less than welcome or less than safe and supported based upon their identification or their family's identification in one of those protected classes. And you know, we don't, we don't like to talk about those things and recognize them, but the fact that there are still racial bullying incidents happening in, in our schools, the fact that students are still using a, a word that we would believe might have been abolished from our vocabulary by this point in time, these all point to the fact that we, we do need to acknowledge those experiences and make sure that that's a part of our conversation around this work and, and areas that we can always continue to do better. So what are we focusing on? We're focusing on students, staff, and families feeling safe and welcome through our, our learning community making sure all students have access to those educational tools and experiences that are going to reach their potential. Building an understanding of what this work really is as we go forward so that we can gain some clarity around that, because you'll see as we review particularly some of the open-ended survey results a little, a little bit later that we are maybe lacking some of that clarity. And then, as I just mentioned on that last slide, really acknowledging and seeking to understand and learn from the experiences of everyone in our school community. We are no strangers to surveys and, and seeking information from families in District 58, and this is just another way to do exactly that. <coughs> Our equity work is not focused on the removal of programs or opportunities. It is not rooted in any political perspective or ideology. It's not intended, and I hope we'll, we'll sh demonstrate that tonight, to be at all divisive or suggestive of anything that has been or is wrong in our community, nor do we anticipate any drastic or significant changes to experiences based on the information we're going to present this evening. 
This work isn't new. We formed the district equity leadership team last fall as part of the equity audit process. So that group of teachers and administrators first performed sort of an initial where are we assessment, and that's part of the ultimate audit. And then they've spent time since that point building background knowledge of what educational equity is and how it's defined in different places, the Illinois State Board of Education tools that are available, and then the kind of re reviewing the draft findings of the equity audit. So this group's work is ongoing. Before that, we have engaged in professional learning offerings for our for our, all of our staff members actually around educational equity and just understanding of implicit bias and things like that. And as I mentioned, some of that strategic planning work that's been happening, our Resources Review Council was a group that spent many, many meetings working on defining and articulating equitable allocation of resources in District 58 as required by our strategic plan. In the curriculum area, we've looked at consistent resources and, and access to those. We've really made sure that our social studies curriculum is up the up Updates are recognizing the kinds of examples that may have been in textbooks 20 years ago that are not currently appropriate. Um, and then we also have looked at some of our eligibility criteria and further defined that. You know, one example of this, we talked a lot last year about double acceleration in math. Prior to last March, double acceleration in math was accessed largely or, or really exclusively through the strong advocacy of a family or a teacher looking at an individual student. And so we took a step back and said that access should not be available only through advocacy. It should be available through procedure and practice. And so that's, that was a really the reason that we spent the time developing that additional clarity around our acceleration and double acceleration criteria to make sure that any student who met that certain set of criteria had that same opportunity on the very high end of the achievement spectrum. We've done a lot of work and we've had a lot of conversations around our dual language program and ensuring that we are continuously reviewing and improving upon that to best meet the needs of that student population. Our work around response to intervention and MTSS really works to ensure that we have equitable systems and that students have equitable access to intervention and supports as they need them regardless of which District 58 building they may attend. Even within our referendum, we've looked at equalizing things like air conditioning and square footage in our, in our middle schools per student. And then recently, too, we've seen we've added a, a summer school free of charge for at-risk students based on some post-COVID availability, ensuring Wi-Fi access. All of this to say that it, equity work in District 58 is not new, and, and this is the kind of frame that has been around it for many years. So the ISBE equity journey continuum is the state um, version of all of this work. And as we've shared previously, this is the state's specific de definition, but essentially they are helping to provide data to every school district in the state based upon the lens of equity and looking at gaps and areas where there are some differences between groups of students within any school. This is, is or within any district, excuse me. This is ISBE's tool and it is given at the district level exclusively. ISBE's why they basically share that we see gaps in achievement between student groups, and we, we referenced that just at the very last board meeting. Within District 58, we see gaps in achievement between our subgroups and our non-subgroup students. And so, you know, th that the idea being we need to make sure we are looking at that to make sure everyone can get up to a point where they can reach their potential and have access to those educational opportunities, and that we're looking meaningfully at the difference between achievement in those groups. So this slide was on the um, report card presentation last week. And so this is what is public facing on the Illinois report card. When you click on Equity Journey Continuum, you see the three categories, student learning, learning conditions, elevating educators. And you see, as I mentioned last week, that we fall on the sort of the, the low three small gaps for the first two and the middle to slightly higher four minimal gaps for the next two. That's, again, they're focused on gaps. And so it's where do you fall in that area? Also, just a reminder that the ISBE information is all based on 2018-19 data, which doesn't make it unreliable, it's just we have to recognize that that's the reference point. This is all the state requires us to release, but we are traditionally and continually a more transparent district than that, and so I'm going to unpack some of this data a little bit further. This, the rest of this is not publicly available, it's that you have to kind of have the login to the backside of the report card tool to be able to access that data. So this is a sample screen of kind of what happens when you break down that student learning box. And I put this up there just to demonstrate there are there is one difference as they're considering that overall student learning number. The things that are about performance are weighted at 45%. The things that are about access are weighted at 55%. So that's just another kind of recognition of where the state is placing some value. 
This slide is our actual data when you roll that down. So the very top um, column, or excuse me, the very top row across is the overall student learning number. So it's 3.07, which corresponds to that dot that we saw on the public facing screen. This now breaks down all of the things that play into that. So kids readiness, state assessments, English learner progress to proficiency, eighth graders passing algebra one. We don't have uh, graduation rate or advanced academic programs because those are high school metrics. And then eighth graders enrolled in algebra one. And so as you look at this, you know, we're, we're pretty, consistently under that 3.07. The kids' readiness is obviously an outlier, and so the kids' assessment, just as a reminder, is given to all kindergarten students, and it must be given, all of the assessing is done by the 40th day of school, and all the data must be entered within the week after that. So essentially, the kids' readiness assessment has a lot to do with how students enter our system. Yes, many of them are in our preschool, but many of them are in other preschool programs or have no preschool programs, and so there are some gaps, that means, between demographic groups in that program and so certainly that's an area that we will continue to take a look at but it also is one of the areas over which we have as a we as a system have the very least control because these students have only been in our system for up as no for no more than 40 days at the time of these assessments the other one that starts to, to that is the least um, far to the right, I guess the furthest uh, on, on the, the gap side, is the state assessment one. And so I want to just give you an example of what the numbers under that look like. So again, this is focused on gaps between groups. So ISB defines that gap as a difference, particularly when it's an undesirable one, between two groups or situations. And for each one of these measurements, there are specific business rules. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of those later, but you know we can always dig much further in. A lot of the comparisons are between special population and non-special population. And so that special population can include any of those um, demographic groups that are identified potentially as at risk, or as Isby says here, experience one or more potential barriers to educational achievement. And so that's just, again, a state designation of what that population means and what that phrase refers to when we see it in the data. Again, this is the data that would be one layer further down from what we're looking at. And so this is on our IAR IAR DLM example. This is our actual District 58 data from the 1819 school year. And so a couple of things that stand out here. So we look at just the very top line is special population ELA proficiency versus non-special population ELA proficiency. To be super clear, that's all I know about what that line means. It means that that special population includes students in one or more of those subgroups. We don't have further drilled down data available to us than that. But you can see there's a significant gap there. As you move down two sets and you see special population group ELA student growth percentile, versus non-special population ELA growth percentile, you see a much smaller gap. All of this is taken into consideration. And so again, this plays into some of the conversation we had last week as, as Member Olchek asked a very good question about how we approach some of this subgroup information. We want to make sure that at the very least, our growth percentiles are closer together. In this particular case, that you know we're within a percentile or two. Our continued work is to see that year-over-year year growth for our populations who, are, who have that achievement gap to be more than a year's worth of growth or perhaps to eclipse the, the population that doesn't have that achievement gap. But this just is really to give us an idea of some of the actual data behind it and to recognize that we, we've, we have identified similar things in our conversations last week and weeks prior around local district data, that we see achievement gaps. We're excited to not see as large a gap or much smaller gaps when we look at growth, which is one of the things that you know, we have a little more control over versus a starting point for achievement. The second goal from the state is about learning conditions. And so these four columns indicate all of the things that are part of the data elements for those learning conditions. So climate survey, both response rates and also the ratings on particular topics, student attendance, site-based expenditures, and then discipline practices. And again, all of this is comparing populations to one another from the state data. I mentioned there are specific business rules for each one. And so I highlighted this one just to give you an idea of how that works. So to be in you know, step four for the teacher and student climate survey response rates, you need to be between 95 and 100%. That's that far to the right yellow column. If you have between 95 and 100% response rates or you know, at that level, that puts you over there. 
When we look at the parent response rates, 76% puts you there. So you could have 90% student response rates and end up at a different step than you could for, for parent rates. And I, and I highlight that just to recognize that each one of these metrics you, we need to look at cautiously and, and just a little bit different. Recognizing this is a little difficult to see, you can see our overall data elements score on the top is 3.1614, and then you can kind of see where each of those categories fall as we go below. Obviously, one outlier on the left-hand side is the in-school suspension rate at the lowest possible rating, which basically says that we have a disproportionate number of students who are receiving in-school suspensions that are in special populations versus non-special populations, or that are within certain, that are within all other races versus <coughs> white students. Does that mean that we made incorrect decisions around discipline in the 2018-2019 school year? It absolutely doesn't say that. That's not what it says at all. It simply, it simply says <coughs> we need to recognize that that is data that is showing in our system, that we have a disproportionate number of suspensions going to students who are in a different one of the populations that are potentially at risk. The third goal is about educator access. And so this really has to do with the demographics between our student groups and our, and our staff groups, as well as some of the evaluation information that the state gathers. And so again, here's just another interesting example in terms of the business rules. For the educator and student demographics cut ranges, if your percentage gap is less than 10%, you end up in step four based on kind of where things are in the state. And so just one example for us, we, have, we had in this data set, we had four Hispanic educators, which put us at 1.3% of our staff population. We have 538 Hispanic students, which is 10.5%. That gap still fits in that step four all the way over. And yet, when you take a step back and look at those numbers, that, that is kind of a, it is a, it is a bigger, a 10% gap is something we might take a look at for any area, but based on where the rest of the state is at, that keeps us over to the far right. It's, that's one that has a little bit of contrast between the state information and some of the findings of the equity audit, just based on looking at the same data from, from two different perspectives. And so again, here is our goal three. We're at 4.26 overall at the top. And again, you can see all of those numbers, even with some of those gaps that I just identified, we still stay in the, in the high side of this in terms of compared to the rest of the state. This is an area of minimal gaps for us across the board. Shifting to the equity audit, because again, as we've talked about, this is a fortunate moment to have two different perspectives on similar data. The audit at this point does remain in draft format. We will post the full version on the website, and that version will include a, a detailed description <coughs> of the process and what led to it, a lot of quantitative data that was provided by the district, district and then just sort of listed as part of the audit, the qualitative data that came from the focus groups during the audit, and the survey results of all of the quantitative questions on the surveys. Those three bullets, the quantitative, qualitative, and survey results, are all incorporated in the audit findings and recommendations. And so that is the area that is the, well, one of the two areas that we have focused on with the district equity leadership team. Because even as we finish some data review and some, some narrative pieces, those findings won't change in the final version. And so we've been very comfortable talking about them and I'm com and we're sharing them tonight. District 58 also asked for an open-ended question because that is typical of our surveys. Basically, almost every time we survey staff, students, families, we add a question at the end that says, essentially, is there anything else you want to tell us about this topic? And we review those. The firm that did the audit did not review that. They simply sent us the raw data and left it for us to review. So that's another exercise we went through with the district equity leadership team was really to look through those pieces and just look for common themes. And we really were cautious and spent a lot of time ensuring that we were what we were pulling out were in fact themes and not just a statement or two that resonated with any one particular individual on the team in any particular way. So the next two slides are going to be verbatim the findings and recommendations that are in the audit. So these are the one sentence summaries of each finding. And then obviously there's some more detailed information and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the open-ended question summary. And then as we'll wrap up, we'll just kind of go through what are the next steps that we might take around based on the conversations and, and the information that's here. So the first set of findings, the first three somewhat go together, but the first one is really about de developing clear language around equity. 
We, as a district, don't have a, a published definition of what we mean when we talk about educational equity. We have a lot of reference points, but we, haven't, we have not declared this is our definition of educational equity. And then from there, one of the findings suggests the potential of producing a policy or a resolution. A, sec a third finding suggests implementing goals. A fourth finding refers back to the, the diversity of our staff and our administration. And so, you know, ap I appreciate the language that says attracting highly qualified as well as racially diverse teachers because we would never separate those two. But that's a finding from the audit. Embedding opportunities for culturally responsive pedagogy and practices and curriculum. In a subsequent slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is and isn't because I know those are, those are words that can have some connotation. Um, the remaining findings. Accelerate opportunities to gifted programming or talented development for students of color and students in special programming. That one I'll just mention again, this is 1819 with the change in acceleration criteria with the work our gifted committee is doing. That's work is already beginning, not necessarily in just ensuring that our, our practices are broader and more equitable. Interrogate the root cause of some of those racial discipline outcomes, which really means is there a root cause? Is there something in our system that is causing that scenario, or is it simply an individual student situation? Trainings on equity, and then the potential to establish a community equity advisory committee. Now let me take a step back and say those are the findings of the audit. From the moment that the board authorized this process, we were very clear that we did not engage in anything further with the firm that provided the audit only because, or solely because, we wanted to have the ability as a district to accept, to take the findings that were given to us, but then for us to determine where we go from here. So any next steps, these don't define our next steps necessarily. They give us some direction to think about what steps could we take as we go forward. The open-ended question was, is there anything you wish to share with District 58 regarding your experiences as they relate to educational equity? And again, students in 3-8, staff and families, and because these findings, were, or these um, responses were not part of the findings, we reviewed them separately. Student themes, we began with the recognition there were just a ton of positive. I love my school, I love Mrs. So-and-so, so a lot of that, which is typical of student open-ended response. There was definitely references from students to bullying or teasing based on cultural differences. Some of that was observed, uh, observed scenarios, some of that was actually this is what happened to me as a student and this is what I was called <coughs> by my classmates for years. References to acceptance or really the lack of acceptance for students who identify in the LGBTQ community and again both an, an observed and a, and a personal. References also to kids referring to noticing and feeling the difference between being considered a smart kid and a not smart kid in the groups and schools, right? Staff analysis, again, lots of comments, some excitement around the work. Some comments that indicate, you know, again, are we defining educational equity or are we defining equity as it relates to me in my role? Some references to the inequities between buildings and schools. We know that we're a community school district and we've had those conversations even around you know, what, what's available in the community. Some references to the hiring and, and population. And some references to the representation of students and the allocation of resources in some of those special programs. Staff comments were, were less in number but tended to be longer in, um, <laughs> tended to be lengthier in, in response. And then finally, our families, a lot of, um, themes around making sure that students have their needs met and access to the resources to do so on all ends of the achievement and growth spectrum. References to inconsistencies between buildings at the community level, PTA volunteerism involvement. Some families seeking more understanding around equity work or straight out stating that they were not in favor of this work and didn't believe it was the role of our district to engage. Some families incredibly supportive of the work and looking for what our next steps were going to be and encouraging follow up and information. References to concerns about things being taken away in the interest of equity. Some references to the focus on emphasizing specific holidays throughout our school. And really I think the biggest thing we took away, frankly, from all three sets of the open-ended questions is the need for further quick clarification on both equity versus equality and again just what what are we talking about? You know, all of this information was gathered almost a year ago now, and so there just there just was not a lot of clarity on what do we mean by all of this. And so that's really where our next steps begin. The first step is we've got to come up with what we mean in District 58 when we are talking about educational equity. So that whether it, it, it meets every need that you have as a, as a stakeholder or whether it still doesn't align with your values as a stakeholder, at least we know we're talking about the same thing. And so the, the, 
excuse me, the leadership team had a chance to begin looking at some of those statements from ISBE, and we really feel like the state is giving us some pretty clear direction on what their lens is for equity and what their <coughs> definition is. We take our learning standards from the state, we take all of that you know, from ISBE, and so that really is a good place to start for us. And so I don't anticipate that we are going to create a District 58 equity definition that, that is a complete outlier from what's happening. I really think we're going to take a look at the, the state language and potentially present that as a possibility so we can just say, this is where we're at. Not necessarily to the board policy or, or procedure level, but really just getting together with that. Because then the next kind of thing that the district equity leadership team really felt strongly about based on all of this feedback was getting everybody on the same page. So once we develop that definition, let's talk about it and engage in continued conversation around what it is and what it isn't so we're all there. And those really are the only two tangible <coughs> steps that we are recommending at this time. However, the district equity leadership team will continue to meet and analyze some of those other pieces that did start to come through thematically in the data. We simply haven't met enough to be able to say we should do X, Y, or Z on this. At this point, we want to say we want to look through this. And that's why I want to mention the culturally responsive and relevant teaching practices because I think that is another one of those things that can, can be explained in several different ways. From, from our perspective, working on culturally responsive or culturally relevant teaching really has to do with making sure that examples that are in textbooks, that language that's being used is, is cognizant of the fact that students come to us from all different backgrounds and part of it is wanting to make sure that kids see themselves reflected in, in the books that they're reading. Part of it is making sure that we don't have outdated things that would make all of us shiver. Our previous social studies curriculum in fifth grade mm -hmm. there, it, it, that's the American History Unit and so obviously there's going to be a, con a, a section on slavery. The textbook used slavery to introduce the word dilemma, such as the slaves on the boat had a dilemma. They could jump off the ship in the middle of the ocean or remain on the ship and become enslaved. Like, the absurdity of that example existing in a textbook is, is even 20 years ago is, is pretty strong. I don't know that I would ever choose to use that vocabulary word in that way, nor is it even an accurate use of dilemma. And so we pulled that chapter a few years ago once it was brought to our attention from even using it with our prior resource. To be clear, that is our prior resource, that is not our current resource. But it's those kinds of things, making sure that we are, we are engaging with materials and in conversations that recognize all of, all of those pieces as we go forward. And again, that is not a next step in terms of we have a pathway, that is a next step in conversation for the district equity leadership team. So that's a lot of information and that really wraps up the equity conversation portion of the workshop. So first we wanna um, offer a chance for any board members to make questions or comments and then we'll go on to the next topic. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for, for all that detail. Uh, any questions or comments from the board at this time, I know. I just have one comment unrelated to this, just to make everyone aware. Um, I just received a message. We are having trouble with the live stream of this meeting. However, the recording is still working. So if you do hear from anyone this evening, I know we're having difficulty with the live streaming, uh, but the recording will be up as soon as we receive it back from the village. So I did want to just let everyone know we do have that redundant system for this purpose, just in case something goes wrong. But just in case anyone hears that you know, tomorrow or this evening, I, I just wanted to make everyone aware. I know James Eichmiller is working on it right now. Thank you. Well, Justin, I know we're early on in this process, but uh, I mean that was a lot of detailed information, and uh, I know a lot of us are excited for what's to come. I don't know if anyone else any, has any other questions or comments at this time. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, <coughs> I had a couple of others to chime in. Um, I didn't want to go first. <laughs> I, the, uh, this is why I'm proud to be on this board. Um, it's because we'll look at ourselves uh, critically and celebrate the things that are working well and try to shore up areas that we are not, whether that's in our work for equity, uh, for educational curriculum, for policies in our buildings, for safety procedures. Um, I think it's, it's important to take a critical eye and as a school board, that's our primary role is to make sure we hold ourselves accountable. <coughs> um, uh, we had the opportunity as a DLT this morning or this afternoon to start to get a preview from Kevin on what the strategic planning process will look like. So this is less of a question, more of a, a statement. I'd be, uh, I think that this is uh, a very unique opportunity when a district is about to write their next strategic plan, which is what we will soon be embarking on potentially. 
and it's an opportunity to have more diverse voices at the table. And so I know Kevin's already talked about, and you know, spoiler alert, not to steal all your thunder, but <laughs> Kevin's talked about bringing in community groups and bringing in uh, uh, different groups of individuals to inform where does the district go next? And uh, I saw in the slides you mentioned a student equity group, right? Uh, an advisory board, per se, I'm guessing. And so in that world, I'd love to make sure that that group of individuals or that group of families is a part of the strategic planning process to make sure they're informing it. Uh, when, <clears throat> when often uh, families or students that come from lower income backgrounds or particular uh, <clears throat> minority groups either feel less comfortable showing up or less able to show up to the evening meeting that is, is made available or to the you know late afternoon meeting that's made available and so just wanted to make that statement but i i love the the transparency in the work and going above and beyond on sharing out what the findings were uh so i appreciate that thank you i'm absolutely in agreement i also didn't want to go first um so thank you for going first i i i really like seeing this drill down of the data and the transparency of the data and i think it's really important for the community to be able to see what what this all is at this stage in time and that there will be more work done there will be more to come um, nothing that we currently have in place is at risk to go away it's it's just making things more which I think whenever you can take the pie and make it larger is a really good effort for everybody um, at the table so you know I think this is great I'm very glad to see that this is um, continuing onward and thanks for the update. I know it's been a long, uh, long journey to get to this, even to the, just this stage. Yeah. So thank you for all the work. Thank you. One other thing, something that jumped out at me as we were going through the slides, um, the, the portion where we talked about the kids readiness test and that mm -hmm. seemed to be one of the kind of the low points in yeah. our scoring, so to speak, on this. and. You know, any study will tell you that pre-K education is like invaluable for a student's lifetime learning and achievement. Um, you know, most people will say like the most important learning takes place before you're five years old. So, obviously, that gap in in achievement for our youngest learners is striking to me. And so, I think something to think about just you know, as we start to brainstorm how we move forward from here is, do we have any opportunities to expand our access to the Grove program beyond just, you know, I was lucky enough to have one of my kids be a beneficiary through an IEP and special education of that program, but do we have opportunities to expand that even further to other at-risk groups that we can try to, you know, bring in more of that population into that program and, and attack that, you know, achievement gap from the very, very beginning. And I, that would be something I would love to hear, like some thoughts on how we can, going forward, you know. No, I mean, I, the one thing I will share is we, we have a preschool teacher on the district equity leadership team, and when we first revealed this data, the gasp was audible. And then, you know, <laughs> she came back to me and said, make sure you know when I'm aware. And I said, well, you know, we, we do know all the things we do. We've had a preschool for all program for a very long time, which mm -hmm. targets mm -hmm. and, and brings in at-risk students. Mm -hmm. We have our, our special education preschool. I think one of the acknowledgments in some of that is that students that are identified in some of those subgroups at that age have some pretty significant discrepancies already that's why they're identified in some of those populations and so you know the discrepancy then is 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 tends to be a little bit more significant because they just haven't had as much time even with early intervention sometimes but I think your point is a very good one and certainly I know the wheels are already spinning with you know what can what can we look at in terms of making sure that we are not only within Grove preschool but we are ensuring that we have access to you know the kinds of supports we can get for our earliest learners throughout the community mm -hmm. and even the idea like the, the aspect of it of um, like we have you know the preschool for all program that's that kind of opens it up to some of those at-risk categories but does everybody know about that is everybody aware are we doing everything we can to make that known to everyone within those different at-risk communities and groups and things that this is a program that's out there for you you know I, I could speculate that there's a good chance that there's handfuls of people that don't even know they have that opportunity so what yes. can we do more in that regard as well? Just yeah. brainstorming some thought. I appreciate that. And just a couple of points to that. I think, Melissa, you said it well. This isn't about taking anything away. Mm -hmm. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. who are we missing that, that should be part of this. Yeah. Um, I think early childhood programming, and this is Captain Obvious here, but the, the more you can intervene at an early age, the more success you're going to have and the higher outcomes you're going to have. Um, you know, as Karat talked about, getting ready to gear up 
to rewrite our strategic plan, one of the things the board is going to be tasked with as a group is to identify key areas of focus that the board would like to see the district focus on, you know, for the next five years and then get community input about, about how do we accomplish those things. So, you know, one big umbrella could be early childhood education, you know, and then access could be an action point uh, to that. So those are examples of things that you could target in the strategic planning process, either through a broader umbrella of, um, you know, curriculum or one specific about early childhood education. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to switch spots with Justin here. All right. I just get nervous coming down here after COVID-19. That's when I used to come down here. Uh, I can assure everyone I'm not talking about COVID. Uh, before I start talking about our current safety responses, I do want to thank Justin. Justin, you do such a nice job with the presentations, but just the amount of data and the work here. Uh, Justin and, and the teams that have worked on this um, have done a really good job, and we appreciate the thoroughness. So thank you very much. I'm here tonight to talk about current safety response structures in the district. It's been a while since we've had this conversation publicly. Now, of course, there are certain things that we're not going to share publicly. In fact, the Open Meetings Act allows the Board of Education to go into closed session to talk about certain aspects of building security. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is our more general practices so the public is aware of everything that we do. In the referendum that we just passed, safety was a big piece of it, but it was one aspect of the district safety overall uh, programming. And so I want to spend some time tonight uh, just talking briefly about the other things that we have in place so the board is aware, our community is aware, and so we can continue to get um, better at, at this. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is every year we have an emergency management committee. This committee meets annually to strengthen our protocols for crisis response. This includes all local first responders. We are very fortunate um, that all of our schools are located in Downers Grove. Even though we serve Woodridge, we serve Oak Brook, we serve Lyle, we serve Lombard, we serve Westmont, all of our schools are, are in Downers Grove. That means we work with one fire department. We work with one police department. We work with one emergency uh, management response team. So that is very helpful because we can be very consistent. You couple that with Downers Grove uh, 99 also having both of their schools in Downers Grove. So now we've got an opportunity to also work with high school district and the police and the fire all together, which is tremendously helpful when you're doing this work uh, and not having to go across multiple municipalities. Um, so. The other thing I want to give a shout out to our first responders in Downers Grove, not only do they you know, come right away whenever there's an issue at the school, they're really there at the ground level helping us plan, uh, be our critical friend, and, and really we are blessed here in District 58 to work with the Downers Grove Police Department, uh, the Downers Grove Fire Department, and then the Emergency Management Response, and then of course uh, the Village of Downers Grove. Just us being in this building is a great example of our collaboration with the Village. We also have something called a district threat assessment team. Now, if you picture these, they're like a Venn diagram. So you've got your safety team or your emergency management committee that talks about how are we going to respond to fire in, in we do fire drills or overall you know, lockdown drills and these bigger type of drills. The district threat assessment team also cover those areas, but they're talking about responding to a specific incident with a, with a student and or a staff member or a community member. So they're similar, but they're different. Uh, this team's dedicated, though, primarily to be proactive and to talk about, hey, if we see something like this with a student or a staff member, how would we respond? What would we do? I want to thank Jessica Stewart. She leads this work. Uh, she co-leads it with me, and uh, she's a great partner in this area. Not only do we have a district threat assessment team, but now each building this school year, we are developing uh, school threat assessment teams, or stats that we call them. So when you do have specific situations at a school, we can review those and we can also plan proactively uh, for those. And then of course we have the Pr uh, Crisis Prevention Institute training, or CPI, uh, which helps us deal with students in crisis. Uh, we have three certified <coughs> district trainers, so now all of our staff members that may find themselves in a situation where they have to de-escalate a student, um, that is available to all of our staff. Should they find that, Jessica leads up that work and we've got some great certified district trainers in this area as well. 
Moving forward post-referendum, one of the big things on the referendum was our secured entrances and just having a visible sign of safety when you walk into that school and quite frankly not allowing a lot of people to walk into the school with a uh, physical barrier like a secured entrance so we are very excited about getting those i've made it clear to our architect and our construction management that that is one of the things we want to see planned for first in the referendum because it is a safety issue and we want to see that done as quickly as possible but there are many other things be are you know beyond just a structure that we also want to start doing in district 58. So we want to work on enhanced screening of visitors when you come into our building, which is quite common when you go to other school districts. We also want to continue our staff and student crisis training, and then educating students further on acceptable language in schools or acceptable statements. So I obviously talked about secured entrances, what that looks like. So in the coming months, the design work will begin and then we will be also developing a timeline of completion. So the board can expect that, you know, on the other side of winter break, uh, hopefully by February, we can have that to you. And then you can start to see a timeline for not only this project, but other uh, projects. Also, we want to move forward, and this is one of those things this school year that we'd like to move forward with. Uh, you don't need a secured entrance to move forward with something called a Raptor system. Uh, a Raptor system is basically a visitor management system that enhances school sec or security by reading a driver's license. And so when you read that driver's license, you're going to get um, some information right away about whether or not that person should be allowed in a school, depending on what a background check picks up. It does not pick up everything, but it certainly is much more um, secure and much more advanced than simply asking someone to sign in and if they're aware of our visitor's policy, which is where we're at right now. Um, do I wish in, that we never would have to do things like this in a school? Absolutely. Uh, however, in 2022, uh, this is our reality and it's a reality that we have to be proactive about. Um, it is pretty common practice when you go to any public school system, including our high schools, you give your driver's license, they scan it, and a picture sticker is printed with your face on it, and it will say visitor, so everyone knows uh, that you were there. Now, I do want to talk about this would be what we would use the overwhelming majority of the time. However, there are certain instances where you can't do this every single time when someone walks into a school. So, for instance, if we're having a holiday celebration and everyone is going to the gym, in those situations, we proactively plan how we prevent people from going to other areas of the building if you don't have the ability to screen 300 people when they're walking in. It's always a balance that we want to strike be, uh, you know, between having community schools where we welcome our families and uh, making sure that we're as secure as possible. Another thing that we are talking about with our uh, threat assessment team across the district is systematic ID and lanyard system uh, for our employees. So if you notice right now, I have a lanyard on with my ID. I always tell the children in our school system if someone has this you know they work here but the issue is many of us myself included have our own choice of lanyards and so no one really knows who is who when they go into the building so we want to make that more systematic which you see is a common practice in many other districts so for instance you could have you know substitute teachers wear bright yellow staff wear green um, another group wears orange so that way everyone knows who's in the building and if someone doesn't have a lanyard, what security measure we have to deploy at that particular point. It's just a visual sign of being more safe. And so again, as we talk about adding secured entrances, we wanna also add some steps behind those secured entrances to continue to enhance safety and move our district along in this manner. When uh, we're talking systematic ID systems for our middle school students and our staff, that would be for school year 23-24. When we're talking the Raptor system, we spoke with our principals and uh, those who work with me <laughs> know that I, I'm not a big fan of mid-year implementations. Uh, it, it can often uh, go awry. However, this is one of those that we believe strongly we can accomplish mid-year and something that we should do. So on the other side of winter break, we're going to be talking about implementing this system and communicating that with Megan uh, you know, to our family so they know what to expect when they come in. We're also working on uh, subsequent years being able, as parents, to give your information to the office during the registration process or prior to the start of the school year so you could be pre-screened uh, so you wouldn't be, um, you know, have to go through that every time that you come into the building. I have that right now at my children's school. Once I've shown my license, I don't have to do it again until the following school year. So 
The other thing that we want to spend some time about is in the event of a crisis or an intruder in our schools, how can we be the most prepared in our school district? How can we align with best practice? So let's talk about our current model. It is a far cry from what schools were trained in uh, post-Columbine. Post-Columbine, we were trained in what we call a traditional lockdown system, where you lock the school down and then everyone hides in the corner and you do your best to be quiet and you stay out of the way. Um, we know from tragedies that that is not the best system. The police don't recommend that system and we haven't used that system for a long time in District 58. Instead, we embrace something called run, hide, defend. You have more options than simply hiding. You could run, you can uh, defend yourself, but you may also choose to hide depending on the particular situation. We have a strong partnership with the Downers Grove Police Department in our current model, and we have strong staff collaboration. One of the things that we are very cognizant of is that we are an elementary school district, and we have kids. There are districts out there that do things that I would never recommend as a superintendent, where um, you know they're making it as realistic as possible. Our police do not recommend that. They recommend doing our intruder drills with the same intensity as we would a fire drill. Of course, we take it serious, but our number one goal is to always make sure that kids feel safe and our staff feel safe. Uh, there is no reason to do some of those drastic measures that you see being deployed. Uh, our police don't recommend that, and that's something that we don't recommend either. So that's what we currently do. And of course, we always give our families notification, and our families have the ability to um, opt out of that if they feel it's uncomfortable for their uh, child. The enhanced model is something called ALICE training. And we'd like to start training our staff on this in the spring and then ongoing, and our students next fall. During this uh, type of a model, or, or when we're deploying this model, we continue that strong partnership with the Downers Grove Police Department, and of course continue working with our staff before we implement in anything. We'd want to work with our staff to make sure that they were um, on board and that they have the proper training. So let's talk a little bit about what's different about Alice versus Run, Hide, Defend. You're going to see very similar things, and they really are similar. I like to think Alice is just as the next step or the next logical evolution um, for school security. So it stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. The difference between Alice and maybe a traditional uh, lockdown system is it's not designed to be sequential. It's designed to be utilized dynamically in each unique situation. So all of us are going to encounter um, situations in life that we have to be prepared for. What we like to think of Alice is, while we hope none of us would ever have to use this, it helps train your mind on what to do in a crisis situation so you're empowered to make decisions that could hopefully be life-saving if you ever found yourself in one of these situations. So in order to do that, though, our staff need training um, and then also our uh, other staff members, our administrators need um, even deeper training to make sure that we can train people on this model. So why would we be talking about shifting to this model? Well, it really is best practice in the field today. It's recommended by the Downers Grove Police Department and the Regional Office of Education. It aligns with our high school district in 99. Other local school districts, the ROE, and again, even the police department for their civilian force train on Alice, and, and, and the village hall will be up next. And so this is a great opportunity for us to align with everyone in our community. So when we start talking safety, it really goes pre-K through 12th grade and then beyond. I think that's very important even though we're not a unit district. How do we do things with the high school in collaboration in an age-appropriate manner that works for our kids so they get a consistent vocabulary moving forward? So as we conclude, one of the other things that we recognize we're struggling with as a school district, it's not district, dist, excuse me, just District 58, it's school districts across the county, school districts across the state and in the country. Post COVID and even a little bit before COVID, we have seen a rise in students making what I call unacceptable threatening statements referencing being some kind of a weapon to school or that they're going to do harm to another child with a weapon. Oftentimes they're referencing a gun or a knife or something like that. I think I speak for all the admin team and in all of our families and all the board where we've all had it up to here with these kinds of statements because they certainly wreak havoc um, on a school uh, community and they also make people feel 
very, very unsafe. We recognize that this continues to be an issue, and it is something that we need to continue to work on as a school district, and that starts with first having another community conversation about this. So this will not be the last time that we talk about something like this, but simply writing a letter from the superintendent saying you can't do this um, doesn't necessarily get us the bang for the buck that we are hoping for. We need to do more, and it starts first and foremost with a community conversation, and that conversation at home uh, with our families and their children. We cannot tolerate these kind of threatening statements. We are also in an age appropriate manner going to continue to go class by class and have conversations. Just like, um, you know, I remember the first time I was in an airport and my parents told us all what you can say and what you cannot say and what may happen if you say those things. I remember that conversation very clearly because my parents told me how serious that was. We have had those conversations with our children in the school district, but they need to continue so children understand the um, significance of these kinds of statements. Um, we are also going to have additional district communication, and then we are um, having conversations about family education opportunities where we can educate our families more on what takes place if these things happen and how you can prevent yourself from being in one of these um, situations. We want to make sure that every day all of our kids feel safe coming into school. They're not worried about a peer or an adult or something that someone's going to say and make them feel less safe at school. But as we talked during the um, equity data presentation, there are certainly areas of focus that we need to continue to improve on. This is one of those areas that we also need to continue to improve on as a school district because we're seeing this happen over and over again. Again, this is not a unique problem to District 58, but it continues to be a problem that we want to continue to work with our police department and uh, work with others in the community, uh, especially our families, to minimize this. So that's just a brief update on safety, some of the things that we're working on in our school district, and I uh, can take any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, you very much. Uh, questions, comments on this portion of the presentation? I have a couple. Uh, Again, thank you for the uh, update. It's a helpful lens into um, the unfortunate reality that we all find ourselves in and having to think about these things in <coughs> school environment. But nonetheless, that's where we are. No. Um, I think about myself a lot as a parent and try to think about what, what should I be telling my student or my child at home about the things that are acceptable to say in school or specifically what are things that are not acceptable. Uh, and I wonder when we think about family education opportunities, that there's an opportunity for a greater level of appropriate <coughs> communication Forgive me if it's already come out, I just missed it. No, it has um, not. So, but a great level of appropriate uh, opportunity for us to have a conversation with our student at home to talk about values that are you know, family specific, but how they align back to values that the school holds that should be community specific. And so uh, I'd love to be able to understand what the timeline for that is and what families can expect. Yeah, so it's a great question and something that we're going to start um, again going over with our threat assessment team when we meet the Monday after um, Thanksgiving break. Uh, that's our, our first meeting. We are continuing those conversations. Um, we are recognizing uh, the importance of a grade level by grade level conversation. Um, it's not appropriate to share the same talking points with a kindergartner that you would share with an eighth grader, right? I, I think we all know that. Um, and we really need to continue to work with our social workers about what are those appropriate conversations? Um, it is certainly a fine line. We respect our families and we respect um, having those conversations at home versus the school always having those conversations. But this one, we have to have a team effort. And so one of the things that we're also gonna be discussing with our Superintendent's Community Advisory Council throughout the school year is help us um, help you. What do you need as families in our school district to have those conversations at home so you don't find yourself in one of these situations where you're at the police department because your child said something foolish. And so that is something that's ongoing. Um, I, again, a, as we've had a couple of these situations happen this year, the proactive measures that we have in place are working for most, but they're not working for all. And so we are looking to do better and we like that suggestion. And so that's something the threat assessment team's working on. Thank you. <clears throat> one of the things that, this is not scientific, so uh, I, I, I'll use it just as an example. One of the things that I hear about when I hear stories, the, the tragic stories that are often you know, weekly at this point of school shootings in different parts of the country, including, you know, or shootings in general in communities, uh, what we often hear is something along the lines of a student was alienated or bullied or felt alone or felt left out and it was a retaliatory measure. Now, I, don't, I say it's not scientific because I don't have evidence, the exact numbers to point to how often that's the case. 
Uh, but anecdotally, that's the theme that I hear. Um, and so I wonder, it's maybe a two-part question. One, how do we take the themes that we hear from the national crisis that we're facing to understand what are the proactive measures besides the things that we are naming here, right? The, the safety procedures and all the things here. I imagine these are part of it. I'm wondering if there's anything else. And then two, particularly around student relationships and whether students feel bullied, are there proactive measures that we can take as a, as a school community to identify who those students might be? Students that don't have a relationship with any adult in the building where they can confide in if they need, if they need support from something that's happening at home or otherwise. And so thinking about those opportunities that we may not be able to do, or we may not have listed on there as individual student intervention. Yeah, I think there's three things that we're looking at more and more uh, as a school district. The first thing is um, there are some common traits. So, you know, from my training that I've gone through with students who commit acts of violence in school, you know, you often do hear they were bullied. Um, oftentimes they may be bullying others as well, but, but you certainly hear that they are bullied. Um, taking bullying very seriously and making sure that um, all of our administrators, all of our staff members are aware of that policy and not dismissing, you know, oh, boys will be boys or those things happen. Um, we need to nip that right in the bud because when students feel bullied, they become isolated. The other two traits that we know is if you don't have any connections to uh, your peers or a trusted adult in the school, uh, that is another characteristic. And then what are you involved in at the school? So if we see a child who is experiencing bullying, they don't really have any peer connections, and they're not involved in things in schools, those are immediate red flags for the school district uh, to get involved in. And so, you know, it starts like simple examples at the middle school level. Our counselors do a really good job with this in District 58 by looking for students who might fit that profile and how do we get them involved in things? How do we address that, that bullying? Um, as Justin shared earlier when we talk about equity, um, you know, that, that's a controversial term and it often gets politicized, but you know, there, there are some things that we've heard in that equity audit about being bullied for various reasons. Like, those are the things that we need to continue to dive deeper into. Um, I, I do understand that kids are going to say things that are unfortunate, but how do we minimize that and how do we really treat that super serious and super swiftly so we don't find ourselves in these types of situations? So looking at that isolated individual and <coughs> bringing them back and, and finding connections for them is, is very, very important. And that really starts with talking with our teachers, talking with our families, middle school level, making sure our counselors are involved so we get kids involved and we're able to make connections with them. And on that note, I think another good area to, to maybe work on, if it's not already been worked on or it's being worked on, is um, family self-identification of what they're seeing, right? So oftentimes if you collaborate school to home, that can give a child better support overall in, in life and, and if a family can self-identify to a school, we need some help, we need some collaboration. What can we do in the school that will help extend what we're trying to do in the home? Um, I know that our staff is really committed to these kids, so um, I can't imagine that if a family identifies. I've seen so many um, communications that have gone back and forth between families and administration and families and staff that have been incredibly supportive. Um, so letting folks know, families know in the community that there exists this opportunity for you as an adult to come to the school and say, I don't know what to do. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I think two things that, that resonated with what you said. I'm so proud of the work we've done with Safe to Help. And that's not even a year old in our school district. I'm looking over at our, our, our team over here. Um, whenever someone does a Safe to Help, we immediately get contacted. Um, we also have online software to monitor any troubling trends um, if a student is on one of our district devices. I can't tell you how many times we've prevented things from happening because of our online software programs or because of Safe to Help. Uh, we're very proud of that. Um, but the school can only do so much, right? Mm -hmm. So much takes place outside of school, and, and we will do our very best to get involved, but one piece of advice, and I am far from a perfect parent, I want to preface this, <laughs> uh, but 
just not allowing your kids to go on their devices unchecked or unfiltered because that is where a lot of the activity takes place online and um, kids can get lost on their devices for four or five six hours at a time and you may forget about them for a moment but but that's when they need us the most um, we are giving kids you know as young as fourth grade you know even younger sometimes these phones, these very powerful devices that can, um, in fact, become very isolating for kids because they, they become addicted to those like many of us as adults are. And uh, it, it's something that we have to continue to take very seriously. Um, we've been talking, uh, you know, today at District Leadership Team about parent education. And these are things that we really want to emphasize around having these good quality conversations. So I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Just to kind of piggyback on that for a second, a couple of years ago we ran a, um, a campaign. A, a, a member Weiner was very active in it in bringing people to talk about social media um, into the district. And I think any opportunity that we can find to educate families on things like social media and even on things like streaming services like YouTube, and then um, just device management in general. We were I was having a conversation with a couple parents on what I do to kind of control access on devices and control time and a lot, it, it's amazing how many people have no idea they're not everyone's tech savvy so they buy a device because they know their kids need it and they and they hand it to them and, and then they really have no sort of visual on, on what's happening there and, and sometimes when you go online think things can start out innocent and get really weird really really quick and I, I think that people are surprised by that they're like well I, I put in that they were 11 you know so in in the Google constraints and I had no idea that it would pivot off into something um, you know, they just kept going to the next recommended, next recommended. So I, I think that there's probably opportunities that we can do for that. Um, I think we all recognize bullying is, is a, a, a problem in general, but I think the word that got hit on a couple of times today was, was isolating, you know, I, isolated, right? You know, when, if you're bullied or you're whatever, but you have a, a, a team that you go back to and you have a core group of friends and you have some, you know, the peers that you have, it, it's a lot easier to navigate that even though we want to still nip that in the bud. So I, we just got to find ways to make sure that we're, we're finding opportunities and, parent, and helping parents find opportunities for their, for their children to find peers that, that they can get along with, find something to be involved in and be active in. Um, because it, you know, cause even if you have a device and they're like, oh, well, they're chatting with their friends, that, that can be um, very isolating. So I, I think those are, are things that we want to continue to see work done, I think, especially post-pandemic. Um, that was isolating for a lot of people, yep. and and so I think that movement is going to be um, is going to be uh, pretty critical. On the, on the more tangible things that you brought up tonight, I uh, you know I wish that none of these things were necessary, but I but I'm a supporter of all the things that you brought up today. I think that Alice is is uh, just a definite um, evolution from the run hide defend uh, practice that we do today, uh, and, th and it makes a lot of sense. The Raptor system, I, I've seen that deployed a lot of places where they, they scan my license, my picture is on my chest, the date is clear on it, and everybody in the building knows you belong here, that's you, uh, and, 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 and the lanyards and the like, and obviously we know that the community has been very supportive of uh, securing our entrances, getting the vestibules the way that, that we need them to be so you don't so quickly pop into uh, a, a population uh, that has students in it. So, you know, I just wanted to, since we just kind of breezed over that, I just want to take an opportunity and say yeah. the, the recommendations that you're making here tonight, I am in, uh, in support of all those and I know that they're highly recommended by the, the police departments and stuff as well so yeah those recommendations are coming again from the uh, emergency management safety team and then also uh, you know as we talk with our threat assessment team from a district level I want to assure our staff who are listening tonight this will not be a light switch change on either uh, everyone will have the proper uh, certifications everyone will have the proper training and we will make sure before we implement this that everyone will have um, plenty of notification um, one of the things I committed to the community as we went around and provided provided factual information at open houses about enhanced safety was that it does not stop with secured entrances. We are looking at this very critically as a school district with our first responders and every chance we get we're going to try to improve our system and these are two really good concrete steps uh, that are not just being recommended by me as the superintendent but again by law enforcement and by the regional office of education. So. Um, we are uh, grateful to take these steps. Um, it, it will be uh, more of an inconvenience, uh, but sometimes in life inconveniences are okay, um, so long as they're um, helping keep us all safe. So I thank the board for letting us come up here and talk about this. Again, um, 
there are going to be times where we talk about security measures in closed session because we're talking very specific details but out here this was general enough where we're able to do this in a public forum tonight and we just got to make sure on the like the raptor system that we are uh, very clear to parents in advance because I could I could easily see a lot of moms walking over and leaving their purse at home because they're just going you know a couple blocks away yep. or, or or whatever it might be and then they don't now they get there they don't have a license so yeah the, the more we can be proactive when that switchover happens so that people can either do that in advance or they know they have their their driver's license uh, and that kind of stuff because I think most of the time people have it on them but you know I could easily see like you know I live so close to the school my wife just running across the street to go in there and going I don't want to carry bags with me right you know so it, it's one of those things that we want to make sure that we're uh, pretty clear on so we have a little less chaos when we switch over yeah agreed one of the things I uh, Megan and I have already been talking about is you know before you implement a change and that's why I kind of said you know mid-year changes I'm not always the most wild about uh, just because you like to introduce it the year before and say hey this is coming uh, but this will be communicated um, not only through our district channels but also through our uh, principal newsletters and uh, other avenues to make sure that our families understand when this change is going to uh, take place so we're going to begin uh, working with uh, uh, our companies to get quotes that we would then bring back to the board for approval and then we would start the process of training our staff and then informing the community of when a change was going to make or, or be made excuse me great thank you okay thank you okay this brings us to public comment the, the board is allotting 30 minute time frame tonight for an extended opportunity with the board and the community anyone wishing to address the board is asked to please state your name and school attendance area please limit your comment to three minutes so that everyone has a fair opportunity to speak we ask everyone to be respectful of the time limits and please be respectful of others and otherwise abide by board policy are there any cards this evening all right they are empty uh, but I will go to the audience and see if there's anyone that would like to make a public comment tonight okay And I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, the Legislative Committee will be meeting next. That'll be Wednesday, December the 7th, at 3.45 p.m. over at O'Neill Middle School. The Financial Advisory Committee will have a meeting on Friday, December 9th at 7 a.m., also at O'Neill Middle School. And our next regular board meeting will be back here at the Village Hall on Monday, December 12th at 7 p.m. That then concludes our meeting tonight. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the meeting is now adjourned at 8.06 p.m.